Okay, let's start with uh, the European Parliament. Before <coughs> we go into political groups. Let's start with the European Parliament. The European Parliament is the only directly elected um, institution of the European Union. As the name suggests, it's a parliament, but it was not originally named as a parliament. When the EU at that time, the European Economic Community, was first established, it was an assembly. And the members of the assembly were appointed. They were appointed by the member states and they were acting more or less as a more consultative body. However, over time, as the EU integration progressed, as the EU integration has evolved, as well as the institutions evolved, there is now a completely different setting of the European Parliament. That was, first of all, desirable to have the European Parliament as it is right now. And over time, you will see that it acquired more and more power. It acquired more and more power because of uh, the issue of democracy, the democracy in general within the EU, and also the criticisms that the EU encountered over time in terms of its democratic deficit. Anybody who heard about democratic deficit in general about the EU? Yes? Why there is criticism about the <coughs> mechanisms of the European Union then? Why people are not super happy about how the EU is run in terms of democra uh, democracy? Because maybe they, their opinion, the people's opinion are not truly um, uh, reflected in the mm -hmm. European Union ruling mechanisms. And how do you reflect, reflect the, the, the people's opinion in general in democracies? Election. Okay. Could you please also like name your names? Okay, so they have, I mean, the, the parliament right now, the European Parliament has some kind of a power that we can actually recognize, saying some budgetary power and some other types of power, and we will see what kind of power it has. Anybody who wants to add anything? Yeah? Also, just a 60% of the European citizens are uh, attending to the election, so uh, it's not, it is not reflecting the whole of the European mm -hmm. It's not 60%, actually, it's even worse. It's about, like, in general, it's about 45%. So, we can see that there are some issues regarding the European Parliament. Maybe that's why one of the most contested institutions of the European Union is the European Parliament. There's one thing you have to remember about the European Parliament, first thing you will have to remember, maybe, is that it's a supranational institution. So, in terms of its characteristics, it's a supranational institution. And what does that mean that it's a supranational institution? It's a supranational institution because it represents the EU interests. It pushes for um, the EU interests rather than the member state interests. So it's not an intergovernmental uh, institution, unlike the Council of the European Union, for example, which is promoting the member state's interests. Um, but the European Parliament is, on the contrary, is a supporter of the EU interests. So MEPs, as we call them, so MPs are the member of the parliament, the parliament. MEP is the member of the European Parliament, in short. I have to write it down, I'll write it down again. But MEP, member of the European Parliament. Those members of the European Parliament are elected directly. They are directly elected from their member states. So each member state, depending on their population, depending on the number of citizens that they have, 
they have a certain number of MEPs that they can send to the European Parliament. It's not the, the size in terms, of, in terms of the geographic size of the country. It is not in terms of uh, the GDP per capita of the country. <coughs> it is the population, the number of citizens, the number of EU citizens in that sense that they have. So according to that population, there's a certain number that is going to be sent to the European Parliament. And that number, as you can imagine, through different enlargements, has evolved. It was first uh, hoped to keep in a, in a fixed number, so the number of the European Parliamentarians were going to be fixed, and the number that will be per country will be smaller, so accordingly to the, uh, the distributed. But right now, the number is increasing, so the number of the uh, European, member of the European Parliament is also increasing over each and every enlargement right now. It's more than 700 of them in the uh, European Parliament. And there are two locations for the European Parliament. One of them is in Brussels, as you know. It's a very nice, beautiful building. And there's another one in Strasbourg. So not every meeting is held in Brussels. It's, it's, it, it is done in a rotational setting that the member of the European Parliamentarians are moving from Strasbourg to, uh, to Brussels uh, in order to convey in certain sessions. So that's not the most practical thing to do, as you can imagine, it costs money. It's not very practical in terms of the whole stuff and the uh, parliamentarians moving back and forth between two countries, but that's the, the current setting. And it looks like it's going to continue to be like this uh, for some more time. And what do they do in general? If we look at the general evolution of the European uh, Parliament, what do we see? As I said, when it was first established uh, with six founding member states, it was an assembly. It wasn't even named as a parliament. But over time, the duty criticisms and due to the lack of power that it has, because it mostly had a more consultative uh, power, so when the decisions were taken, by, when the, the Commission proposed the legislation to the Council of the uh, European Union, at that time Council of, Europe, uh, Council of uh, the EU, or the Council in general, or Council of Ministers, the Council of Ministers was asking the, the Parliament's opinion about certain legislation. And if the, 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 the European Parliament uh, was not quite agreeing <coughs> with that legislation, it didn't really have a power or the decisions that it proposes in terms of their opinion were not binding. So that created an issue regarding whether or not uh, the European Parliament actually has any power. And second of all, in, in, in terms of its uh, representation, whether or not the decisions that are being taken at the EU level, which are applied entirely uh, for every single EU member state, is done in a, more, in a, in a democratic setting. So the bureaucrats basically deciding on what the EU citizens are going to be uh, doing or how, what kind of a setting they're going to be living. So that brings us to the issue of accountability. As you all know, in a democratic setting, the elected people are accountable to the people who are elected them. That's in every single parliament in, in the democratic states, that's the case. Just because you're a member of the parliament doesn't give you the right to be able to do anything you like. Because you're representing your constituents and uh, because of that, you're given a power to represent. And you have to use that power accordingly. So that's why there should be enough checks and balances established that you're not going to be abusing your power, uh, the given power. So that's why you have to be accountable from the actions that you're doing. But in this case, as the uh, European Commission bureaucrats were not elected, and uh, the people who are, as we discussed, the core of her people, the people in the Council of the European Union, are not elected. So that's why it created this strange setting that we were not possible to talk about uh, accountability issue in the European Union. And we will see on the second half of this course that the EU and how the EU law has supremacy over national law and it's a supranational uh, legal system that creates various other issues and problems. So this democratic deficit issue uh, became a huge issue over time. And that's why, over time, the European Parliament acquired more and more power and authority. 
So its functions also evolved over time. The European Parliament that we see today is actually a relatively powerful European Parliament compared to many years ago. And the first elections, direct elections, were held in 1979. So the European Economic Community is established in 1957, and it took more than 20 years that the, uh, the European Parliament has its first direct elections. So people were directly elected, more democratic system was established. And when they're elected, these members of the European parliamentarians are not necessarily representing, they use a certain number of quota from the member states, but that quota doesn't mean that they're going to be representing their member states. So let's say I'm Italian, and I'm a member of the European Parliament, I'm being elected, uh, before even like, being elected, I will be representing a political party group, which means I might be representing Greens, Social Democrats, or Christian Democrats, or Liberals. So I will be representing, not Italy, Italy, I will be representing, I will be a candidate from Italy for the Greens or for the Liberals. So I will be representing a political ideology in that. And after I've been, when people are electing me, they will be obviously voting for me as a person, but at the same time, they will be also voting for the parties, for the ideology I represent. Either left, right, middle, far right, far left, whatever. And after I've been elected and I become an MEP in the European Parliament, then I will not be sitting in national group sittings. I will be sitting in transnational political party settings. So I will be joining together with, let's say, I'm representing the Liberals, and I'm an Italian Liberal in the, in the European Parliament. I will be sitting together and I will be deciding and discussing and promoting certain policies, legislation, with all the other Liberals coming from different parts of the European Union. So the German Liberal, French Liberal, Danish Liberal, etc. So we will be all organizing a transnational party group in the European Parliament. And this picture over here that you're seeing with all these colors, like the rainbow colors, are representing those uh, different political parties. I'm also uh, handing you out some documents. You can also have a look at these ones as well. Before I give it to you, It will take some time to travel on the other slide. So the biggest uh, group uh, with the blue, as you can see, the European People's Party, it's about 274 um, people who are member of, uh, part, uh, are member of this party group. The European People's Party is what kind of party? Right, left? It's the right party. Um, uh, in short, we sometimes refer them as the Christian Democrats, basically, the centre-right. So, in this picture, we can actually see that the European Union that we see today, so this is the result of the 2009 elections, by the way, so this might change, it's mostly a more conservative Europe. So, Europe at this moment is in the middle, in the, in the middle of the right, basically. So, the European People's Party had 274 seats, as a political group, and it's followed by the red part. What is the red part? Social. They're the Social Democrats, so left uh, in the middle, basically, like center-left, as we can see, it's 195 uh, seats that they have, the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats. And it is then uh, followed by the yellow, which is about 85, I'm not sure if you can see it, but it's 85 as a number there. And it's the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats of Europe. So it's the Liberal Party, basically. Then it's followed by the Greens, with 58. Greens and the European Free Alliance. And the ECR, with 56. European Conservatives and Reformists. Any idea what kind of a political idea they represent? The ECR, the 56. Conservative, but not, not a, um, what kind of a conservative? 
Are they very keen on having a more federal Europe? Or are they against of having a more federal Europe? Against, yes, right? They're the right and it has to be against. There are more you're skeptic and anti-federalist. This is the type of political ideology they represent. And they're followed by, by 35, the European United Left or Nordic Green Left. They don't necessarily think that the Social Democrats are left enough, so they have their own specific uh, ideology of understanding left, so they have their own group uh, with 35 members. And there's also with 33 members, the Europe of Freedom and Democracy. Sounds wonderful. It's the far right, basically. It's the far right. And there are your skeptics <laughs> as well. So as you can see, there is a considerable amount of your skeptics in the European Parliament. So various political groupings and various political ideas are represented in the European Parliament. Not everybody who is in the European Parliament are necessarily supporting the European integration process. So some of them are very skeptical about this. Some think that some people are thinking that the European integration process is not going in the right direction, in the right track, and in order to have a say, they wanted to be represented in the European Parliament. And some people are even against the EU in general. They think the EU should be dissolved. And that's the place, ironically, that these issues are going to be discussed. It's the European Parliament. It's a supranational institution supporting the EU interests, which doesn't support the member state interests. And that's the place that these voices are heard. That's the place to be. And you will also see there's uh, the non instructs so they're not really part of any uh, political party group. And there are about 30 uh, seats. So it's about 766 seats, about, about, let's say, more than 750 seats. You don't necessarily have to remember every single number, but you, don't, you just have to remember that, basically, if you look at the political spectrum in the European Parliament, what kind of a picture do you see from this picture of greens, reds, yellows, blues? What would be your evaluation of this picture? What kind of a political standpoint we're talking about in the EU? In general, about the EU citizens? Nothing? Is it in the far right? Is it on the far left? It's center, right? Center right, center left, and liberal. So we're talking about an EU, which is not in the extremes. We're talking about the EU that is in the middle. A little bit more conservative, it looks like it. Conservative and liberal side is a bit on the right. It's a bit more, uh, at this moment, looking more prominent. But we're talking about an EU which is in the middle. Social Democrat, uh, Christian Democrat, in that sense, in the middle. And there are also <coughs> more extreme uh, political ideology that's also represented. But there are certain, uh, there are much in, in, in smaller groups. What else I'm going to say about these member of the European parliamentarians is that there are different uh, countries who are obviously sending um, people from their own ethnic groups and everything. So there will be second generation Turkish citizens, immigrants. Uh, second generation immigrants who will be also a member of the European Parliamentarians. So they're, they're going to be a member of the European Parliament uh, in that sense. So um, we also see certain names. You, you can come across with certain names that are representing Belgium, Netherlands, or Germany, for example, that are in the European Parliament. And from different political groups as well, interestingly. But mostly it's coming from... Uh, from from, uh, from Germany, from the immigrant-based countries in that sense. In England, there is a substantial amount of Turkish population as well, and Turkish Cypriot, uh, true. But so far, as far as I know, no, no member of the European Parliament had Turkish descent um, that I know so far. It's one of the largest transnational electorate body in 2009. About 375 million eligible voters that exist. If you look at the more democratic parliamentarian system, I think 
Another example can be India, probably, which has such a different kind of um, transnational, in that sense, different group representation. But it is one of the, its largest transnational electorate by 2009. And every five years, it uh, elects uh, its members by universal suffrage since 1979. And as I said, in 1975, when the first election happened, it was, the, in that sense, um, the election that has most participation rate. It was more than 60%. So even in the highest, it was 60%. More than 60%. People uh, went to vote for the European Parliament elections. Nowadays, on average, it's about 40%, a bit higher than 40%. So there is a, there is a very small percentage of participation which also brings about all sorts of criticisms. As you all know, in the last, 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 last election that we had, people were discussing that there is a very low participation rate, about 80%. 80% have never existed in the, um, in the European Parliament elections. So now there is an issue because what happens is that 40% is electing members that is going to be representing the 100%. So that 60% is not going and voting. There are different reasons why this is not happening. One of the major reasons is that because people think that it doesn't matter. So there is a, a, a general understanding that the role of the European Parliament is not very big in terms of EU politics. And some people argue that it doesn't have too much of a power or authority. That's the other reason why people are not interested. And Europe in general become more apoliticized as well. So they're not very interested in their national elections and local elections, yet alone in the, in the European elections. So that's one of the other reasons. Um, that's why there is a low participation rate in the elections. But one of the major reasons is because, as I said, that people don't think that the European, what the European Parliament does actually matters. So that's why they're not very much interested. And it's one of the lowest um, in, the, uh, in the history so far. The highest is in Luxembourg and in Belgium, about 90% people are going on voting. And lowest in Slovakia, surprisingly, it's a new member state, who about 20% is going to vote for the, uh, the European elections. The president of the European Parliament, if you're going to look at the general institutional structure of the European Parliament, the president of the European Parliament does not ha necessarily have a very substantial role as uh, the president of the European Commission or the Council of the European Union. He is Martin Schulz since 2012, and he acts as the most of like a spokesperson or anything. That's a more representative symbolic value that he has. And um, the and if you look at, um, at the, the powers of the European Parliament, first of all, we will see that it has budgetary powers, which, does, which means that as any parliament, that when you propose a budget that has to be discussed and accepted, <coughs> the European Parliament approves the budget. Uh, for, for example, in 1999, the Re European Parliament refused to approve the budget of the Sanchi Commission due to the allegations of the mismanagement in the commission, and there was an en masse uh, resignation for the first and the first time, and it was the first ever forced resignation as well. So when you think about it, it's a quite a substantial power. You're approving how much money that is going to be spent by the EU and the EU institutions in terms of its policies. And it is possible that you might not approve the budget. So that's a possibility that you're, uh, you're not going to be approving the budget. So that's one role. But that's not limited uh, to that. It has a power in the consultation procedure. I handed out, I mean, if you look at your handouts, um, that you will see that the court decision, and there should be, um, there's the cooperation. I think in the consultation, it doesn't have a, a map. Uh, in 1980s, it, a consultation procedure has been introduced, which means that uh, the European Parliament was consulted when it comes to making legislation. In 1996, 
The cooperation procedure was, uh, you can see the cooperation procedure and how uh, the Commission, after it proposes a draft, how Parliament is, has the power to cooperate together with the European Council in order to give its opinion uh, for legislation to pass. In the cooperation uh, procedure, it, uh, it was originally introduced by the Single European Act uh, in order to give a more role to the European Parliament. And as, that, as I said, the European Parliament over time acquired more and more power. It was an evolutionary process. It, it gradually acquired more and more power over time. And that was, and how you acquire more power? You acquire more power through different mechanisms. <coughs> mechanisms of decision making. And this is one of the mechanisms. The cooperation is one of the mechanisms. They were asking the European Parliament's opinion about the draft legislation, positive or negative. Uh, so it was done in the Single European Act because there was the, these were the measures that were related to the single market, the operation of the single market, the internal market that was operated. And later on, this was not considered enough. So then we see, now we call it as the ordinary decision-making procedure, is the co-decision procedure. As the name suggests with the co-decision procedure, the co-decision procedure assumes that the decisions are going to be taken together with the Council and the European Parliament. So in the co-decision procedure, which is now called the ordinary uh, decision-making procedure of the European Union after the Lisbon Treaty, more and more subject matters are under the co-decision procedure and more and subject matters have to be decided in collaboration between two major institutions of the European Union, the Council of the European Union and the European Parliament. There's one thing that you have to keep in mind. It doesn't mean that the European Parliament still doesn't have the right to initiate legislation. What does that mean? In any democratic system, in the Parliament, the parliamentarians or the group of parliamentarians can initiate legislation. They prepare a draft legislation, and then the Parliament is going to be discussed. And after it's been discussed, it's accepted or not accepted or amended, and you come up with a solution. In the European Parliament, they don't have the right to initiate legislation. What they can do is that if a legis draft legislation is prepared by the European Commission and given to the European Council, at that point onwards, they can present their opinions. It's called the first reading. If you look at the, the core decision procedure, it looks incredibly complicated and sophisticated and complex. And I'm not expecting you to remember every single step and detail. I would like you to ex uh, remember every single step and detail. No, of course not. But I would like you to remember, in general, how the process works. What you're going to remember is that, first of all, you need two institutions to come together. And secondly, the European Parliament actually has the right to amend, to change, or to accept or reject the, the draft proposal. And after the first reading, after this is, um, this travels, as the saying <coughs> puts it, European Commission proposes, and the European Council, and the European <coughs> Parliament disposes. It's the European Council that will be sending the first reading to the European Parliament. And after it's been sent to the European Parliament, the European Parliament can either accept it, say, yes, wonderful, let's accept it this way, and there's no problem, or it might amend and send it back to the European Council. And this has to be then discuss in the European Council, um, in the Council of the EU, in the Council, and then they might change those amendments and they might send it back to the European Parliament, and this is called the second reading. And after the second reading, either the European Parliament can say, yes, amazing, wonderful, well done, and accept the proposal, or they might reject it, or they might ask for further amendments. And after that point, after the second reading, by the Council, either the Council can approve those, those changes that are proposed by the European uh, Parliament, 
Or in case that they reject it, then that, that's the problem. Then we, another committee, uh, conciliation committee, has to be formed. And this conciliation committee has to come up with a text that is acceptable both for the Council or the European Parliament. And if they cannot come up with a text that is not accepted uh, by both sides, then too bad the Act is not going to be adopted. And it can be, uh, as you can see, it's a long process, it takes time, it is not straightforward, it's time consuming, it's, uh, it's not uh, easy in terms of effort, and um, as you can see that some people might argue that this is not the most efficient system of drafting a legislation because you're trying to involve an intergovernmental and a supranational institution to work together to come up with a common uh, text that is acceptable on both sides, different interests are represented. In one side it's representing the member state interest, in the other side it's representing the EU interest, but on top of that, as I said, with these different colors, the, the European Parliament is also representing different political interests as well, different ideologies, different uh, point of views. So you're combining all these variables together and you're trying to come up with a text that is acceptable in this complex structure. So on one hand, some people argue that, yes, well done, this kind of co-decision procedure actually gave more power to the European Parliament and member states, um, sorry, the European Union citizens are more represented in this new setting. They have a say, at least, with the European Parliament. But on the other hand, <coughs> they're arguing that it made it a bit less efficient uh, in terms of functioning of the European Union. Very complex and not very efficient at all. Effective or efficient at all. So when we're evaluating the whole process, we have to take into consideration of this. And if you're looking at these things from the point of view of a supranationalist, the supranationalists will argue that this new setting with these more acquired powers of the European Parliament, we can talk about a stronger, more integrated Europe with a stronger identity, a European identity, from an EU identity, because it's now closer to the European citizens and the Parliament has an equal setting in terms of adopting and deciding uh, different acts and texts. But if you're looking at it from an intergovernmentalist point of view, then you might also argue that, well, it is true that the European Parliament has more power right now, but still the Council of the European Union, who's representing the member state interests, very powerful, and without the Council of the European Union, the Parliament cannot decide on anything, and we can still see the, the impact of the member states becoming more prominent. So you can really look at the, the picture from two different sides, and try to evaluate the whole situation from two different points of view. I think the, tr the truth lies in between these two points of views. And it's true that over time the European Parliament acquired more power and has more authority right now. So we can talk about a more democratic union that is representing the European citizens that's supposedly bringing the EU towards closer with, uh, to EU citizens. But at the same time, still we cannot really talk about a parliament in the sense of a national parliament. Because it lacks the initiate legislation and it lacks other types of powers as well. So, we can see the <coughs> issue from different points of view. <coughs> Any questions so far? No? So let's move on with the PowerPoint slides. Oh, okay. So we discussed this uh, more or less. Um, so the consultation was in 1980 uh, through a European Court of Justice ruling. And we will see when we're discussing about the European Court of Justice what kind of role the European Court of Justice has. It's like a constitutional court, it's a high court of the European Union. So its decisions are binding binding for every single member state. And what happens is that in terms of the formation of the European Union law, 
the decisions of the court is also part of the EU acquis, the EU acquis communautaire in Turkish, so every case will be added to the EU acquis. It becomes part of the, the body of the EU law. And through that, uh, the European Court of Justice initiated uh, with a decision, the consultation procedure that the European Parliament should be consulted in these draft proposals. And as I said in the cooperation procedure in 1986 with the Civil European Act, and the assent procedure in 1986 again with the Single European Act, which is not used uh, very often, it's usually done through uh, major decisions, so for example, big like, enlargement decisions um, that, that's been used, but it's not used very often, that procedure. And then the co co decision procedure is introduced in 1993 with the Treaty of the European Union, and then it's become the ordinary decision making procedure by the Lisbon Treaty. And the reason why the court decision procedure became also an ordinary decision-making procedure is because of the enlargement it had an impact on the EU, that it becomes more important that these decisions are taken together with those two, uh, two institutions. Uh, with this idea about the symbolic value of, uh, of the European Parliament as well. Because over time, the Euroscepticism has increased and become an issue for the European integration. The citizens don't necessarily feel very close to the EU. The EU, in that sense, is seen as this distant <coughs> place in Brussels, where certain decisions are taken, and then they're dictated in the member states. So in order to get rid of this general idea about the EU dictating it from a higher level, from a supranational level to the EU citizens, they try to involve the European citizens into the whole process. Well, this is how it's done with the elected members of the European Parliament. More or less we discussed, so I'm not going to go into detail and you can have a look if you really want. Uh, <coughs> Ascent procedure, uh, as I said, it's not, very, it's not used very, very often. Uh, it's introduced by the Single European Act. And the ordinary decision-making procedure, which is the co-decision procedure, is far more important and very critical for us. So the Council of the European Union on a wide range of areas, for example, the economic governance, immigration, energy, and these subject matters over time evolved as well. Uh, before, there were a more limited number of policy areas that the co-decision procedure was used, and over time, it expanded on different, different, different types of policy areas. And if it's involving different types of policy areas like immigration, which is considered usually a sensitive issue, which gives a more supranational character to that policy area too. Why? Because it's no longer decided only by the European, uh, Council of the European Union, which is the intergovernmental body of the, the European Union, but then you're giving power to the European Parliament to decide on this issue, which might be sometimes against to a certain member state's interest. So it gives a more supranational characteristics to that policy area. And there are some sensitive issues that one might, one, one member state might consider, for example, immigration or energy. So you can see that even those are areas are, over time, acquired a more supranational character. And the vast majority nowadays, the vast majority of the EU legislation is now adopted jointly by the European Parliament and the Council. And as I said, it's evolved over time from its first introduction in 1993 till 2009 from each treaty. Keep in mind, each treaty that the EU adopts changes something, amends the institutional structure of the EU. Also the power structure of the EU, the decision-making structure of the EU. Either it can bring some completely different new issues, or it can change certain actions that are being done in a certain way. It's a constant evolving process. Here it is, another graph of the core decision. There's a reason why in every single book there is a different kind of graph, because it's quite complicated and uh, it's not necessarily very easy. And each I remember like seeing in one of the other, like one of the, one of the sources, they even put 
numbers in terms of time. Like the first step takes three months. The second step takes, let's say, five months. This and that. And overall, it will just end up being like two years before <coughs> a decision is being adopted. That's why it's being criticized that, yes, well done, it becomes more democratic, but is it more efficient? The question mark. And another, this is the idea, is the, there's a light bulb up there, and the idea is crying, like already regretting that it's an idea probably, because it's gonna go through uh, a long process until it becomes a decision basically, or a text, or an act, or whatever. So as you can see, it becomes quite complicated and uh, sophisticated in the plenary sessions. And the European Parliament, um, as I said, in, in, in addition to the, the party groupings, there are also every member of the European Parliament, or, uh, Parliament will be involved in different committees. Like in the national Parliament, there are also different committees. Like there will be a committee on, let's say, human rights, and there will be a committee on foreign relations, there will be a committee on environment. And these parliamentarians will be involved in, different uh, in these different committees in terms of their interests. And sometimes they will be, for sure, working on their expertise, but sometimes it can be just for curiosity, because there's no limitation whether if a member of the European Parliament wants to be part of a committee. So that's why when you keep, when you think about it, the people, the member of the Euro European Parliament, uh, these members are not technical experts usually, they're politicians. So that's the difference between the European Parliament and the MEPs versus the European Commission and the European bureaucrats. On one hand, we're talking about people who spend their all time and effort on uh, specializing on different topics. And they have a certain interest, so they have the interest of representing the European Union and promoting the EU objectives, goals, etc. On the other hand, it's a parliamentarian, as the name suggests, he or she is a politician. So he or she is going to be promoting not the member state interest, but maybe personal interest, personal issues, or ideological issues. So when you read about the statements, keep this in mind, this differentiation, because one of them is political versus bureaucratic. So that's why you can also see this reflection, this difference in, in, in terms of its reflection. For example, the progress report that the Commission prepares will be very uh, technical and try to promote a certain process that is in the objective of the EU versus the, the report of the European Parliament. And that can be more critical, I mean, I'm sorry, that can be more critical in the sense that it might be criticizing a candidate country more severely, or they can be saying things that normally the Commission would never ever say, because they feel like they have the freedom to act accordingly. And the conciliation part here, maybe that's the last one I've seen. Six weeks plus two weeks, six weeks. This is only the conciliation. After it becomes the second reading, still it's not accepted. Out of the conciliation part, six weeks plus two weeks, six plus three, two weeks, which I can calculate. Let's say from the most optimistic perspective, it's going to be 18 weeks. The least optimistic perspective, it's going to be about 24 weeks, six months, after it reaches the conciliation committee. So it just tells you a general idea, and you will hope that it's not going to reach the conciliation committee, although it's going to be resolved much earlier. So in general, this is how the European uh, Parliament functions and operates. Any questions that we have so far? Shall we give us a 10-minute break then?